Hey everyone, welcome back to the CYPT channel. Today we're looking into IYPT 2021, problem number 4, wind speed. The problem states that when we have electric current flowing through a coil and cold air flowing over the coil, the temperature of this coil will decrease. The problem wants us to use this effect to measure the wind speed and to determine the accuracy of this method of measurement. This video will be a little bit more technical. Let me know in the comment section down below whether you prefer more technical details or just a simple phenomenon showcase. First, let's build a setup. For this problem, we want the material of the coil to heat up in air. This puts some restrictions on our material choice. This material must have a low electrical conductivity while being resistant to oxidation at high temperatures. This is the reason incandescent light bulbs must be placed in an inert atmosphere like nitrogen or argon, or else the oxygen in the air will quickly oxidize the tungsten filament, leading to a short life. For heating in air, a material called nichrome is often used. Nichrome is an alloy of nickel and chromium. It is electrically resistive and not easily oxidized at high temperatures. When nichrome is heated to red hot, a layer of chromium oxide forms on its surface. This layer protects the rest of the material from further oxidation. In fact, you can find nichrome wires in many home appliances like hair dryers and toasters. Here I have some new 30 gauge nichrome wires. I wrap the wires tightly around a 1 8 inch diameter brass tube. This makes a nice coil. Then I cut off two pieces of this brass tube. I place the two ends of the coil into the two short tubes. Then I add a bit of solder to bond the tube to the coil. These tubes will act as both electrical conductors and heat insulators. To hold this apparatus, I got a few pieces of popsicle sticks and built a stand for it. To perform measurements, I connected the two terminals of the coil to a DC power supply. This power supply displays the voltage and current out of its terminals. We will only take the current value since there will be some voltage drop across the testing leads. To measure the voltage across the coil, I connected a multimeter in parallel with this coil, making sure that the test leads are as close to the coil as possible to minimize the voltage drop across the brass tubes. From the current reading of the power supply and the voltage reading from the multimeter, I can determine the power draw of the coil and the resistance of this coil. As I increase the supply voltage, the current will increase. This means that more power is drawn by the coil. The temperature of the coil will also increase, and as the temperature increases, the rate at which heat leaves this coil also increases. The system will reach a steady state and the temperature of the coil will stabilize. This is perfectly illustrated by this infrared video of the coil. Let's see how the resistance of the coil changes with respect to the power drawn. You might expect the two to be unrelated, but we see this really interesting curve in the data. Let's construct a simple model to try to understand this graph. The resistance of this coil is given by the resistivity of the material times the length of the wire that makes up the coil, divided by the cross-sectional area of the coil. All three of these have temperature dependence. The resistivity of the material follows this equation. Here, rho naught is the reference resistivity, alpha is the temperature coefficient of resistivity, T is the temperature of the material, and T ref is the reference temperature. This reference temperature is fairly close to the room temperature. The cross-sectional area and the length follows a very similar formula. Here, beta is the thermal expansion coefficient of the material. All three of these come from the first two terms of the Maclaurin series of 1 plus x. Combining all three, we could get that the temperature-dependent resistance of our coil is given by this formula. Next, we find the temperature dependence of power. We know that electrical power drawn is the same as the thermal power dissipated in the steady state. There are three ways heat can be transferred from the coil to the surrounding air. Conduction, convection, and radiation. The rate of conduction heat transfer is proportional to the temperature gradient of the air around the coil. The rate of convection heat transfer is proportional to the temperature difference between our coil and the surrounding air. The rate of radiation heat transfer is proportional to the difference of the fourth power of the coil temperature and the ambient temperature. 
The temperature gradient of air is difficult to know and the contribution of conduction is relatively small. We will neglect it. We could write out the formula for convection and radiation. Here H is the convection heat transfer constant. Epsilon is the emissivity of the material. This depends on how shiny the material is. And sigma is the Stefan-Boltzmann constant. A sub s is the surface area of the coil. This is not to be confused with the cross-sectional area of the coil. We could write the surface area of the coil using the cross-sectional area and its length. Finally, we combine everything to find the resistance over power as a function of temperature. What can we see from this equation? Well, let's take a look at the asymptotic behavior of this function and see if it matches with our trend in our measurement. As the temperature of the wire goes to infinity, R over P will approach zero. As the temperature approaches the room temperature, we can see that R over P becomes very large. So we expect R versus P graph to look something like this. This is exactly what we see in our data. This model is by no means perfect. One notable problem is that it does not account for the fact that the convection heat transfer coefficient is dependent on the Nusselt number. The Nusselt number is dependent on the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number for free convection and the Reynolds number and Prandtl number for forced convection. Let's take a step back. What all of these derivations tells us is that theoretically we can measure the temperature of the coil by just measuring its resistance and power drawn. Let's build on this idea a little further. Here I heat up the coil and let it cool naturally. I can plot the temperature versus time and it looks like this. We could fit the solution of convection cooling to it. We see a relatively good agreement. There are some deviations at high and low temperatures, and this is likely from the other two modes of heat transfer playing into effect. If we know the heat capacity of the coil, we can estimate the values of the free convection heat transfer coefficient this way. Finally, I blow wind over the coil using some computer fans. I measure the wind speed using a commercial hot wire anemometer. When I plot the power dissipated over the wind speed, I see a linear relation in this velocity range. In theory, I should be able to measure the power dissipated by the coil and use it to measure the wind speed. Here, the uncertainty in slope is about 11%, so there's little hope to get more accuracy than that. But considering that my commercial hot wire anemometer is only accurate to within 5%, this setup really isn't that bad. I hope you liked this video, if you did please make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.